Let's take a look at arithmetic versus logarithmic rates of return. Now, the reason we use rates of return rather than the change in the price of a stock, for example, is because a $1 change in a $10 stock is more significant than a $1 change in a $100 stock. And actually, you see it reported a lot in the uh, Wall Street Journal and other newspapers about how fast the Dow Jones Industrial Average got to the next 1,000 mark. And it should get to each one faster and faster because it's a smaller percentage gain. When you go from 1,000 to 2,000, that's a 100% return, a doubling. But when you go from 10,000 to 11,000, that's just 10%. So, you know, that's why we look at rates of return. And the standard rate of return or arithmetic rate of return, and we will signify it with the uh, R subscript A for arithmetic, is the future value divided by the present value minus one. Or you can also write future value minus present value, all divided by present value. So it's essentially what you get minus what you paid divided by what you paid. So if a stock goes from 100 to 105, what's the rate of return? Well, most of us probably didn't even have to do the calculation this way. I think we can look at it and say it's a 5% return. But using the formula, right, 105 minus 100 divided by 100, that would be 5 over 100, 0 0.05 or 5%. Okay, and usually arithmetic returns work pretty well, but continuously compounded arithmetic returns are not symmetric. And this tends to be a problem. So consider the case where the return goes up by 15% and then goes down by 15%. So if we were looking at the future value, we would say present value times 1 plus the return, 0.15, right? Then times 1 plus the return, but the return here is negative 0.15. So if you work that out, it's going to be future value equals present value times 0 0.9775. So here we can divide both sides by PV. And then we can subtract 1 from both sides. Okay, So if we divided both sides by uh, PV, this would cancel. And so you would have uh, FV over PV equals 0.9775. And if we subtract 1 from both sides, which we can do, okay, this gives us a rate of return here. And it turns out that it's minus 2.25%, which seems odd, right? You go up 15%, you go down 15%. Shouldn't it be 0? But it's not based on this um, compounded arithmetic return. So one way to deal with this problem is to use logarithmic returns. And the log return, which we will denote with R subscript L, is the natural log of the future value divided by the uh, present value. And the function ln of x answers the question e to what power is equal to x. And e is that constant in math, which is approximately 2.71828. Okay, so if we note that e and ln are the inverse of each other, so I have this equation here. If I took e to both sides of this, I would have e to the rl here equals e to the natural log of the future value divided by the, uh, the present value, right? And these would just cancel. The natural log and the e would cancel. So I'd get e to the rl equals future value over present value. And if I wanted to do a little manipulation, multiply both sides by pv, and then I could just rearrange terms, I would get future value equals pv e to the rl. So this is the continuously compounded future value equation. OK, the equivalence between the two formulas is the following. The return on the, lo uh, the log return, the logarithmic return, equals the natural log of Ra plus 1. Why do I say Ra plus 1? Well, what was Ra? Ra was the future value 
divided by the present value minus 1. And so if I add 1 to it, it's going to be future value over present value, which is the equation we said we had. And likewise, we can manipulate this. We can take the um, uh, e to both sides here, right? That would get rid of this logarithm return, and we would have e to the RL. And I can do some little algebra, and I get the arithmetic return equals e to the RL minus 1. So from the previous example we had, it turns out that if we use this, this logarithmic return, the return is not 5%, it's 4.88%. Actually, this is, a, this is a return that has continuous compounding. And you may have seen that before. I think in, in some previous videos I've looked at return. And if you compound the return 5% once a year, you'll get a certain um, return. But if you do it twice a year, okay, 2.5% twice a year, you'll actually have more. So if you compound continuously, literally all the time, not even every second, but every moment in time, you don't need 5% to grow your $100 to 105 um, at the end of the period. You only need 4.88%. Turns out that for small returns, arithmetic and logarithmic returns will be similar. But as returns get further away from zero, these two formulations will uh, give us produce increasingly different answers. And here's a graph that shows you that. So on this, um, on the x-axis, we have the logarithmic return. On the y-axis, we have the arithmetic return. And you can see that you know, when you're close to zero, they're really, well, actually, when they are zero, they're the same. And if you're pretty close to zero, it's not a huge interest rate, then that you get about the same answer, right? 4.88% is pretty close to 5%. But once you start getting out here to, say, 20%, then they start to differ. This uh, curved line, which is, I think, blue, and this is black, is the logarithmic return, and this one here happens to be the um, happens to be a 45 degree line, which shows you where the two would be equal, and so you can see they start to diverge as you get bigger interest rates. Okay, so when you start getting to 20 percent, you can start to see a difference at least in the graph. Okay, 4.88 and 5 percent. You know, mathematically, we can see it's pretty hard to see in this graph. Uh, but if you get out here to, you know, 40%, you can see there's a pretty big differential between the two. The two returns are not that similar. The two returns are starting to diverge. And that's what you have here. So this is the logarithmic return. This would show you if the two were equal. And as you can, you can see it curving away, you can see the gap here getting wider. And if it's a negative return, the same thing. So this is rather um, important because, you know, again, for small returns, 1%, 2% doesn't make much difference. But if you're talking about 20%, 30%, now you're talking about there being a real difference. Um, in stock market modeling, it's common to assume that returns are normally distributed. Uh, log returns are far superior to arithmetic returns since the sum of repeated samples from a normal distribution is normally distributed. But this is not, uh, however, the product of repeated samples from a normal dis distribution is not normally distributed. So when we take 1 plus r times 1 plus r times 1 plus r, that is not normally distributed. And if you're making some assumptions on the return distributions, then the log is better because we actually add those together and the additive property is normally distributed. Okay, some advantages of arithmetic returns. Um, arithmetic returns aggregate well across portfolios. Uh, the arithmetic return for a portfolio is simply equal to the weighted average of each um, securities arithmetic return. And 
one thing that's important is that arithmetic returns are widely understood by the public. Okay, if you're trying to make an argument or you're testifying in some uh, court case, uh, it makes a lot more sense to use arithmetic returns because people actually understand those.